I booked passage on this transport! No planetary travel without a chain code. But I have to get on this ship! What's up, Meta Nerds? In this video, we'll pull from every resource to completely understand the Snivians, mammalian humanoid species native to Kedomia Prime, which present a unique and fascinating case study in species adaptation and cultural development. Kodome Prime, located at grid coordinates R3 in the Outer Rim Territories, within the Kartalo Sector, is a frigid world characterized by its harsh, intolerably cold winter. Its landscape is dominated by tundra plains, and it features an extensive system of subterranean caverns. These caverns provided crucial shelter for the Snivian during the planet's sub-freezing winters. Often simply called Kodomai, it lies along the northern end of the major hyperlane, the Hydean Way, and it is orbited by a single moon. They stand at an average height of 1.4 meters, about 4 feet 8 inches, making them shorter than many other humanoid species. Their appearance is marked by large nostrils and a protruding lower jaw and two small tusks. And they exhibited a range of hair colors from brown to black, and display a wider variety in skin color and eye color. They were capable of speaking Galactic Basic, but they also have their own language which involves snorts through their nostrils. <laughs> and most are fluent in both their native Snivian language and Basic, though they tend to be literate only in Snivian, and when speaking Basic, they have a distinct nasal accent. I want what I'm owed. We had a deal. Someone will hear you. Their fascination with galactic culture makes them eager to engage in Basic with non-Snivians, and they are particularly delighted when others attempt to communicate in their native language. But of course, there were some Snivians that felt that speaking Basic was betraying their culture. And their homeworld is very cold, but they didn't develop thick coats of fur to keep their bodies warm. Instead, they survive by having a unique skin that allows them to exist in sub-freezing environments, having many layers of dense skin with special membranes that control the opening and closing of the pores. The membrane network can be consciously controlled by the Snivian to let body heat escape in warm climates, or to trap in heat in the cold Kadomai winters. But their body temperature is regulated by this membrane network, which conducts thermal energies efficiently through their bodies. And they don't have to worry about frostbite, they have a sort of sacrificial layer of skin on the outside, with their final layer just being dead skin cells. In general, they're known to be gentle, insightful people, as entire tribes would have to be packed in together for extended periods in those subterranean homes during the winter months. But despite this gentle nature being generally true, there are some intensely bloody moments in their history. Every time they give birth, they give birth to one male and one female. This was the genetic norm for thousands of years, at least since the Snivians evolved from hunters on the tundra plains of Kodomai. But in the past, genetic mutations, a flaw in the, quote, blood code, sometimes caused male twins to be born. This is so rare that there are only 200 documented incidents of this in the past two millennia. When you had two males during this birth, one would always be a standard, healthy child, and one would always have a specific genetic flaw. This flaw didn't produce any visual differences, but they had a 1 in 3 chance of mutating into a personality-afflicting disorder. In most cases, this led to sociopathic behavior and created killers among the peaceful people. In the past, three charismatic but truly evil rulers have risen as a result of this defect. The first two were taken out by a popular revolt, but the last, Zeroldspadar, was felled by off-world forces of the Old Republic. Before the advent of genetic engineering, there was a practice of keeping twin males incarcerated and monitored. You had to lock them both up, not knowing which one was the evil twin. If sociopathic tendencies appeared, the offending twin underwent a process of personality reprogramming, which included mental conditioning, but also seems to be a sort of lobotomy, as they were, quote, transformed into simple-minded shadows of what they once were. And think about how horrifying that would be for the healthy twin there, who is also being constantly monitored and had to worry about some action of theirs being misinterpreted, from those constantly monitoring you looking for any sign that you might be the next mask killer. But the Snibians eventually mastered genetic engineering, so that these male twin births were minimized. They unraveled and stabilized the blood code, and their species prospered, stretching their civilization across the four habitable worlds of their system. But then they fell into the hands of the Thalassian slavers. In this vile trade, the Lassians captured and sold the Snivians to others who would use their skins for industrial purposes, having that unique combination of being incredibly dense and those thermal insulating pores. 
it was only because of the intervention of the Old Republic that they were saved from being hunted to complete extinction. But this wasn't the last of their challenges. As they became more ingrained in the larger galactic community, it's been shown that centuries of hyperspace travel may have undone the genetic corrections of the past and reawakened the blood code. And of course, Snivian scientists are carefully watching to make sure no twin brothers rise again. On World, their government model is a participatory democracy, with members being elected onto a ruling council called a Chevron. From there, an executing officer is voted based entirely on artistic skill. The Chevron is elected every 12 Snivian years, with the executive being elected every year of the Chevron's rule. They were able to develop sublate space travel on their own, but adopted hyperdrive technology from the more advanced alien species of the Republic. And while Kadomai never became an industrial hub, they were renowned for their artistic achievements and have traded and sold their works across the entire galaxy. And although that usually meant sculpture, literature, and even some philosophy, they are often overlooked for their engineering, even if that wasn't the center of their civilization. But because of that blood code issue, Snivians concentrated on genetic science, with their work rivaling that of the Bith and the Lurians. But there was a major difference in that the Snivian genetic sciences were all reactive in nature. They were formed to defeat specific flaws, not to explore knowledge for its own sake. And as a result, many Snivian research projects with great potential were stopped once specific problems were solved. Other species like the Bith have used Snivian science as a starting point and carried that on for greater research projects and discoveries. Which if you saw the Bith video, that became a nightmare or a utopia depending on how you look at it. But with their innate creativity, many traveled the galaxy simply to amass new experiences and live life to the fullest. But as a result, they're often found in fields that they are not equipped to handle as they are attempting to build up their so-called mental furniture, living in different ways to be able to create their great art. But this is why you have many inept bounty hunters and smugglers that over the past have just been Snivians attempting to write poems on these professions. And it's part of the main reason why you always see them hanging around in cantinas. Like any good writer, they know that the bar is the best place to soak up stories and get new leads on life's next great adventure. For having a face like this, a lot of people don't realize that just about every Snivian you would meet is secretly in agony trying to realize their life's master work. And I'd imagine the cantina helps take the edge off in that regard as well. A typical lifespan was up to 105 standard years, which is a lot longer than most species. Because of the extreme cold and prolonged winters, it necessitated the Snivians spend extended periods in those subterranean caverns. This isolation and confinement played a significant role in nurturing their artistic talents. Here they would hone their skills across a broad spectrum of artistic mediums. They specifically excelled in holography, painting, sculpture, music, and literature, contributing significantly on a galactic level. They developed a unique form of art known as the trans novel, a culturally distinct genre that was effectively a multimedia product, with text and other artistic elements used in innovative ways. Even as technological advancements reduced the necessity of their traditional hibernation-like lifestyles, Snivians continued to value and practice these long-established cultural habits. This showed that even when they could dwell on the surface in modern heated buildings, perhaps something like a human's day-night cycle, this want to just go underground during the winter and produce art was entrenched at a biological level. And many Snivians, driven by their artistic passions, ventured across the galaxy to experience and understand the lives of potential subjects for their future works. This approach to art characterized by immersive and sometimes perilous experiences really shows just how dedicated they were to their craft. Other groups, like the Zygerians and the Karazaks, were also active in the slave trade in the Outer Rim. The involvement of various senators in the slavery ring prior to the Clone Wars really shows how they were being forsaken both by evil aliens and the galaxy-spanning government, making it nearly impossible to regulate and crack down on. And despite this betrayal by those on Coruscant and the government's inability to stop this, they did have an unwavering faith in the Republic, many joining the Coruscant security forces and bringing what power they could to try and protect their home world and sector. And though they would not play a major role in the Clone Wars, either on the side of the Republic or CIS, likely because their world had no natural assets, we do see them in major events like the auctions involving Jedi Padawans or in Chalman's Cantina in Mos Eisley. There was also the bounty hunter Sinrich, who invented the holographic disguise matrix, seeing this high-tech engineering as a sort of art in its own right, and their involvement in the rebel cell known as the Spectres on Lothal. The Kiel and Zutan were in Chalman's Cantina during the true rise of Skywalker. They were involved in various aspects of the galaxy's underworld, most notably working for Jabba the Hutt. There was Sol Charlis, who was bullied on Dirk Teal, for obvious reasons, while the Snivian brothers Nod and Narb were criminals residing on the Colossus refueling station, a true embarrassment for these otherwise highly enlightened people. 
who really proved the old adage not to judge a book by its cover. That's it for the breakdown, and as for cool facts and behind the scenes stuff, they first made their appearance in A New Hope, their identity being further clarified in an entry about Sinrich in the official StarWars.com website. They would appear in Rise of Skywalker in 2019, portrayed by Jake Lunt Davies, and if you want to learn more about them, be sure to check out Complete Locations, Visual Encyclopedia, and the Ultimate Alien Anthology. Please hit that like button, subscribe to see more, and check out these videos, I'm sure you'll like them. But most important of all, remember, what some call a manic psychotic episode, Snivians just call performance art. And the Force will be with you. Always.